In the words of the great philosopher Shrek, ogres are like onions, and so is Malazan. <laughs> Welcome back to StoryTube, everybody. So, I don't walk the chain of dogs. I have finished Dead House Gates. If you watched my Gardens of the Moon review back in January or February or some time like that, I began my journey into Malazan Book of the Fallen, this 10-book monstrous series. And I loved that book. It was full of fantasy craziness and magic and talking puppets and humor and burning questions and mysteries about the world and dead house gates whew, this is a gut punch of a book this is an emotional wrecking ball of a book and let's talk about why this is a great book it's a fantastic book it's an amazing book it is not difficult in the sense that it is confusing or hard to read which again is a purpose of these videos that i'm making not only just to vlog myself going through these books but also to break down those barriers of oh this is such a difficult series this is a tough book in another sense in this in a sense that there is a journey in this book there are several journeys in this book that might exhaust your soul but they will make you think and they will challenge you in ways that you explore the richness of the meaning of the layers of whatever is going on this book is an onion there are several layers of meaning and symbolism and poetic mirroring that you can analyze in this book and i'm sure it's going to only get better as the books go on but it doesn't sacrifice that fun and those mysteries and that rich fantasy world that I think fantasy readers just really love to get their teeth sunk into. And this is a this is a book that you can really sink your teeth into. There's a lot of meat here. And I don't mean that it's beefed out and that it's almost a thousand pages, at least in my edition, and, and, and it's a slog. This is not a boring book. This is a this is an epic ancient myth of a book but it is i think written quite accessibly i do actually find ericsson's writing style to be fairly accessible i'm not sure it's dense to the point of being absolutely opaque and impenetrable i think it's dense in a different way in 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 a way that you can still enjoy this story you can read about these characters and you can get through to the end of each character's journey in dead house gates and not have to really delve deeper into what's being said, what is underneath, what's the symbolism here. There's just enough of it that it's there if you can, but it's not alienating. And I think my perception of this series before going into it was that I would find it alienating and the, the fans would sort of be alienating. Um, and I haven't found that either. But anyway, in this video, um, I'm going to sort of start off with non-spoiler thoughts and what did I think and did I enjoy myself and would I recommend this book to you. So for people who maybe watch Gardens of the Moon video and are maybe convinced to dip their toes into Malazan and how did I get on with book two, I'm going to do non-spoiler first for the first half of the video and then later I just I need to talk about what happened in this book and the symbolism and what it might mean. Um, I've stayed away from all sort of other videos or content about Malazan or really I haven't talked to many m mates online about it either even though I had been discussing Gardens of the Moon or I thought I needed to discuss things to understand it but I wanted to experience this kind of on my own terms first half of the video non-spoiler second half we'll get into spoilers and I'll let you know may not be half and half it might just be a little bit of a non-spoiler anyway dead house gates did i like it yeah <laughs> would people who liked gardens of the moon like this yeah would people who didn't like gardens of the moon like this possibly 
Um, I think that if you thought Guidance of the Moon was confusing and difficult in that way, Deadhouse Gates is a lot more straightforward. Structurally, on the surface, it also seems quite straightforward. It's pretty much a load of people going from point A to point B. Classic fantasy quest storyline. And it, to my personal taste, not my favorite kind of thing in literature and fantasy. Going from point A to point B. However, there are books like Lonesome Dove, which is one big journey from of cowboys bringing a load of cattle from Texas to Montana. And that's going from point A to point B. And I love it. That's a story about life. This is a story about life and memory and civilization and archaeology and history and the layers that we bury in the literal earth and the stories of us that we bury or we forget what that means for society and for humanity and not even just humanity but i guess the non-human characters in this book but you get what i mean the way that we build on top of past mistakes and keep making those mistakes that's what this book is really about under the surface but on a superfluous level we follow disparate characters as they're journeying across the desert for various reasons to try to get to a holy ancient city in the north of this continent called seven cities it might be in the north it might be in the very south either way Loads of people are going from point A to point B across an entire continent, a desert continent. The setting in this is so cool. For the first 200, 300 pages, I was right in there. I was, I was, I had that buzz for the new characters, the new setting, the new mysteries. Um, I wanted to be learning things about everybody. And I found it very compelling and, and sort of propulsive. And then tr in the middle of the book, I don't think it slows down, but he's setting up the pieces and he's teaching you things about these characters and this long journey that they're all going on and that and you feel that journey. But I think comparing it to my more negative experiences with some fantasy where it's a quest and it's just going around in circles in not a bad in not a good way, this goes in circles in quite an interesting way structurally. I'll come back to the onion thing from the beginning. This book is an onion. They stink? Yes. No. You are always learning things about the characters. So you're not just repeating the same bit of development or the same unraveling of uh, uh, a character's psychology. You're not just repeating it over and over again. You're not just going through the same motions of, well, there's another battle over here and another battle there. You're learning something new, I think, with everything that happens. But you need to get through the muck and the dirt to come to the end of that journey and feel a sense of accomplishment and to really ponder what the endings of these tales mean. I think that you need to be prepared for this book in that sense, expectations-wise. I don't think it's a difficult read. I think you just need to sit with it. It took me a lot longer to read this book than it took me to read Gardens of the Moon. I think I read Gardens of the Moon in like a week and a half or two weeks, maybe. This took me a little over a month, partly due to the fact that I was extremely busy for a few weeks. You know, life was getting in the way, but again... If, if, you know, you're super busy, if your brain is cluttered, I maybe would recommend taking a, taking a breather with Dead House Gates, like I did. But then it also makes the journey sit with you a little longer. And I think it heightens the experience a little bit. Now, I'm not somebody here on YouTube who thinks that reading a thousand page book for a month is a particularly long time. But I know that some people in this community devour books and maybe have a you might get a sense of impatience slow down trust the process and maybe if you take your time reading the book it will impact you the endings will impact you a little bit more 
that might be a generalization. If you want to plow through this book in two days and it still hits you, that's fine. But I'm just saying that don't let it dishearten you if you're taking time with this book. Anyway, back to what it's about. Bunch of disparate characters going from point A to point B, from one end of this desert continent to another. And the continent is an open rebellion against the Malazan Empire. It's the basic setup of this book. And we have a whirlwind on the horizon coming. And the whirlwind is like a storm. It's like a sandstorm. But it's also going to bring about the rebirth of an ancient being known as the Shaikh and her army of the apocalypse. They kind of worship this being. There's also a member of the bridge burners from Gardens of the Moon who was on a quest to assassinate someone. Not going to say who, non-spoiler section. There's also, we, we follow um, a member of the nobility who has been enslaved and we follow her alongside a former historian, former priest with no hands and their huge bodyguard who is a mysterious figure and they go on a journey themselves. And then we also follow two friends, Mapo and Acarium, who I'll just say now, it's my favorite storyline of the two books that I've read so far. They're two best friends who, again, I won't spoil anything now. I might give you some of my thoughts on this relationship later in, in, the, non -sp in the spoiler section. But one of them is trying to uncover their lost memories. And this is part of this circular cyclical onion structure that i'm talking about there's a lot of mirroring in here because these two friends that one of them is trying to uncover their memories they're they're walking about the desert trying to remember and maybe one of them has different motives ambiguous motives that you learn about across the book and it affects their relationship and then the sort of the other POVs we follow are a few characters from Gardens of the Moon who are there in Seven Cities, the continent, and they're also on their way to the Holy City. And one of those characters is one from Gardens of is the one from Gardens of the Moon who was possessed and is holding the memories of the one that possessed her. And again, not trying not to spoil Gardens of the Moon either. If you watch the Gardens of the Moon review and you're watching this. I'm being careful not to spoil too many things, but I want to sell you on these books as well. So her journey, I feel, mirrors the other character's journey that they're uncovering their memories. And this other character is living with so many memories that they're kind of going in opposite directions, but they're circling each other. And they converge later in the book and and this is an aspect of this book one little example of how this book is just so symbolically done and this again structurally Erickson really thinks about this um, and he really thinks about the structure of his books and I think Dead House Gates in terms of that is a huge step up from Gardens of the Moon I think Gardens of the Moon is a is a fantasy thriller with a ton of magic and a ton of mystery and it's ingeniously structured in in my opinion and i understand how people might find it confusing and a little yeah abstract dead house gates is a lot more straightforward but but that ingenious structure is still there and he works with it and he he really thinks about the the hidden meaning and symbolism and poetic mirroring with that structure a lot more with dead house gates it's just a more deeply thoughtful book and I loved it. Is it quite as enjoyable a romp as Gardens of the Moon? Not for me. It's a different reading experience. So like it's hard to compare the two of them. But I think if you were a person who found Gardens of the Moon just a little too abstract, a little too complicated in terms of the structure, not difficult to read, but just uh, a little scattered. 
this is a lot more satisfying. It's a lot more structurally visible, <laughs> if that makes sense. And it certainly is, um, I think, accessibly written. Accessibly written in a sense that there's density in this book. There's richness. Oh, you both have layers. Oh. But you don't have to delve into it if you don't want to because there's still an enjoyable surface level of stories here if that's what you want. If you like 1998's The Mummy, if you like Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End, specifically the sections where they go to Davy Jones' locker or the journey to get to Davy Jones' locker, and you like epic war novels or epic war films like, I don't know, Bridge Over River Kwai or Apocalypse Now, you might really love Dead House Gates. Uh, if you like quest fantasy, you also may, really might enjoy Dead House Gates, but be careful about what it is you want from the end of each quest and think about it. But this book will make you think about it. So, that's my pitch, I guess. Bit of a rambly pitch for people who are watching this video alongside the Gardens of the Moon video that maybe want to see how I'm getting on further on with the series. Uh, but I can't talk about this book, really, without talking about the ins and outs of the characters and what happens in it. Um, I will say that before we get into spoilers, last little bit, my favorite storyline was obviously Mappo and Acarian. Mappo and Acarium. Everybody in this, every, it seems to be that a lot of people talk about loving the Chain of Dogs storyline here uh, and, and Coltane and that whole uh, leading refugees from one city to the holy city of Aaron and everything that they go through on that journey with the 30,000 refugees. I found that storyline to be one of the least interesting storylines for me in this book, actually. Interesting, it, it sure was interesting, but I wasn't as compelled by this one as I was by Mappo and Acarium, and especially, I think actually my favorite character was Felicin. Now, I don't know really what people's reactions are to Felicin, but I imagine that she's a controversial character. I imagine that she's probably one people either love or hate. Um, again, I've stayed away from a lot of reactions to this book. I wanted to go in fresh to this video, just talk about my thoughts, talk it through. I don't have a ton of answers or interpretations for things, but I can see her being a character that would cause debate, let's just say. So again, no spoilers for now, but those are my overall impressions of Dead House Gates. I think this is a masterful book. I think it's a tough book, not in terms of difficulty, in terms of impact. So give Dead House Gates a go if you liked Gardens of the Moon. Give it a go if you didn't like Gardens of the Moon. I would say give Malazan at least two books before deciding that you want to continue or not continue. Anyway, into spoilers. I'm going to put the book down. Spoilers. I want to talk about onions and archaeology. <laughs> Everything in this book is a circular, cyclical, cut an onion in half. And it was a joke that I thought of originally with Shrek saying, oh, ogres have layers, um, onions have layers. But it's absolutely true. This book, in my mind, is that shape. Cut an onion in half, not at each stem, but in the middle, hold it up, and look at those circles. That is, this, that is the structure of this book. That is the symbolism of this book. Uh, I don't know if Erickson ever thought about it as an onion, but I did. So anyway, here, here we go. <laughs> oh, they make you cry. No! Oh, you leave them out in the sun, they get all brown, start sprouting little white hairs. Erickson clearly loves archaeology. Of course, I do know now that he studied archaeology and, and history and anthropology mean a lot to him. The, the study of civilization, civilizations, and that just comes out in, in, in a, abundance in Dead House Gates. I feel like it's what the book is really, really about. It's, it's archaeology, it's history, it's how we bury shit. We bury our bad deeds in the dirt and we build over it with more bad deeds and we keep going and we keep doing that and we forget about what's underneath. And every character represents this in some shape or form, 
we repeat history regardless of actually whether we know it or not because there are different interpretations as well and it's not a coincidence that we follow two historians in this book that are beside two of the important i guess classical fantasy figures but there's also a lot of mirroring and poetic kind of symbolism going on when you strip back every layer but this cyclical nature is also to do with the characters themselves mapo and acarium i i thought this storyline was heartbreaking probably one of the best friendships i've ever read I recently, like, I, I find some similarities as well with Lonesome Dove. I recently read that and Gus McRae and, and Woodrow Call in that, in that book have a wonderful friendship, a complicated friendship. A friendship that is, seems a little hostile and, and too complicated to be genuine love. But that's exactly what genuine love really is for a best friend. So Mappo is trying to shield Acarium from his memories because he thinks, he believes that Acarium will just go back and repeat it once he learns about who he really is. Or he wants to protect his friend from learning about it. And he wants to just carry on in this cycle of traveling around with the person that he loves and honestly for the longest time in this book i thought that they were lovers and i'm not sure whether i liked the fact that they were it were just fr friends really really good friends or if i wanted them to be lovers i'm still not sure i'm still undecided but there's an element there there's just a real profound love that he wrote these two characters with that i really appreciated and they go in circles um and, and so does everybody else. <laughs> Everybody's story in here kind of does come full circle, uh, except for maybe one or two. But Absalar, for example, from the first book, has all of Kellen Ved's memories. Or sorry, not Kellen Ved's, Cotillion's memories. The other one. And when they pair up with Mapo and Acarium, and there, there's a conversation later in the book where she's basically saying, like, my memories are not defining me, that maybe you should let them go, or something like that. You can tell that they are circling around the same thing, but they're, on, they're in different points, and I just thought it was a genius move to put the two of them together. But also just the, the physical symbolism of, of things as well, with Callum wanting to go assassinate Lacine. And he's going through all of these trials and tribulations. And at the end, he kind of begins where he... At the, at the end, he finishes his journey where he began, almost. But with a real rich sense of learning. That's why I felt this book didn't drag at all in terms of the quest. Like other quest books that I've, I, I've read that I found repetitive... This book wasn't repetitive. It was teaching each character something and teaching the reader something about those characters or about the grander scale of things. There's constant reference to what is buried in this desert, wanting to resurrect things. Also, the shike needing to be resurrected. The whirlwind itself is a fucking circular onion. But the purpose of the whirlwind itself is to bury shit in sand anyway um but they're going to be burying one empire just to birth a new empire because the shaykh herself is another populist autocratic figure it's similar in a sense to like paul atreides from dune or something the dangers of this cyclical whirlwind of violence all the characters mirror that so I, I thought that Felicin was actually my favourite character. Um, and I don't know, I assume the internet probably has issues with Felicin. <laughs> um, I'm not going to get into all of that. But I've, I found her to be profoundly fascinating. And very realistic. Uh, realistically portrayed in this sense of a teenager lashing out and building up walls. And building up this idea of vengeance in their mind against their sister. Just because they've they've put a tag, they've put a label on that. 
person that did them wrong and she wants to go after her sister Tavor. I never once really believed that Absolar was going to be uh, the Shaikh reborn. I thought that we were leading towards, oh, it's actually Felicin. I didn't think that from the beginning, but when we got about maybe 50%, 60% into the book, I was like, maybe Felicin is, is who we are really following here in terms of the Shaikh and the army of the apocalypse. And she is Paul Atreides here. Um, and I just love that storyline, but also the heartbreak that she, she breaks your heart because you know that she is broken and she is constantly pushing people away and the people she has around her, Heberic and Baden, Baden I found really, really interesting. And ultimately, obviously Baden is the one that kind of cracks her shell, but it's too late. Um, she's not in a great spot when she becomes the shaykh later. So it's inevitable. It's just this cycle of violence that is going to continue. But she breaks your heart. It's similar enough to actually Jorg Ankrat, I find, from the Broken Empire. Why I like that character as well so much. Like is a simple word to use. I am compelled by these characters. I'm fascinated by them. And at times I do kind of like them because you empathize with them. So then obviously you also have Absalar from Gardens of the Moon who was possessed and she's going on this opposite journey, again mirroring Felicin but also mirroring Icarium that she was on a different trajectory on this onion than Felicin was. So I just didn't buy that Ericsson was going to make Absalar the Shaikh, even though there's a bit of, there's a bit of like a faint, like a sleight of hand, very D&D. &D. <laughs> um, a bit of magic trick, a bit of show you the thing and then put something else behind your ear. Um, it's clever. Could be a little artificial, but it's clever and it's fun. Um, so I didn't really think that Absalar was going to be uh, the shike, even though they arrive at some kind of the the gate or whatever it is at the, towards the end of the book but it's actually Felicin and Heberic it's not Absalar and her father who we meet in this book um in Iskarol Pust's lair or whatever you want to call it Absalar moved away from being broken accepted that this disassociation these memories were not her own and that she's not going to be that person now she could have chosen to become the shaykh um, and then maybe justified it in her mind that well instead of being forcibly possessed I'm choosing to do this but I just didn't see it in the in how this book was setting up poetically she's in a different place and Felicin right when Baden dies is in a place where she's constantly falling and falling and falling and she's almost, she's hit rock bottom, then Baden dies, and the walls around her break, but it's too late, so she is absolutely going to become this whirlwind, this vessel of vengeance, I guess. But I just loved all of these, everybody being on a similar journey, but on different stages, in different sections of this whirlwind itself. And, um, it's ingeniously plotted. This book is ingeniously structured. It's also, it's no coincidence that two of our major POVs are historians and we're kind of interpreting things through their eyes and how they feel and how they think about the situation. And we're witnessing the rise of three major myths uh, in this world, in this book, with Coltane and the Chain of Dogs, which uh, this might be an unpopular opinion, but like I've heard about the chain of dogs before going into this book. So it seemed to be the thing from the outside that people really latch on to. And I, I liked that storyline, but I found it the least interesting. Just the military stuff, the, the well, military logistics. I like military stuff, but the military logistics and the sort of the slightly repetitive battles, it kind of wore me down a little. Uh, so I was always waiting to get back to Mappo and Acarium or get back to Felicin, actually. But I can't deny 
that the ending of that storyline, the chain of dogs, when we get to Aaron, is soul crushing. And I can't remember the guy's name now, but the guy that they get to shoot Coltane uh, with the arrow at the end, that scene is almost from is almost from his perspective i feel like it kind of was a little bit maybe for like one paragraph you get a, a slight bit of his perspective but it's it's heart-wrenching there's so much in this book that's heart-wrenching that made it a bit of a draining experience but intentionally so and i appreciated that it's the same with lonesome dove or any epic journey in a war film or a war book um this is exactly the cost of war um, and the atrocities that humankind are capable of and the atrocities that humankind are capable of burying over and repeating over and over again um and i don't know if it i just thought it was also very visually cool there's in these two books how he describes things visually. I'm a very visual reader. And I imagine the film in my mind. I have a bit of a background in film too. So I I, I see shots and aesthetics and, and things in my mind. When he describes cool shit to me. So there's two, obviously two in particular scenes. Um, but just to stick with the chain of dogs for a second. When Coltane dies and the crows come and take his soul. I don't know if that's him like ascending to be a not a god but an ascendant um or is that just him going to heaven i don't really know what that means yet um i guess i'll see what other people's interpretations are of that but i think my initial interpretation of that in the moment was that he was ascending capital letters <laughs> and that maybe it's not the last we'll see of coltane he'll probably be some sort of godlike divine figure also because he I never really latched onto Coltane in this book, but everybody else did and it felt like is he going to become some sort of divine figure? Again, I I'm also in a bit of a Dune mood. I just went to see Dune Part 2 and I love Dune the book. And I I never really also got behind Paul Atreides because I'm also just predisposed to not want to follow an empire <laughs> it's bred into me but these divine like figures i i felt that scene was just very cinematic that the crows taking him up i thought it was him ascending and everything leading up to it with everybody worshiping him basically all the the people in in the the refugees and his army it was interesting but you don't follow him specifically you follow duiker and I loved Duiker. Obviously, that might also be intentional. You latch on to the characters you are with as well. And I did really latch on to Duiker. What happens to him at the end is also a gut punch. It's also tragic. I also didn't really get what was going on at the very end there with somebody. Was there, Are they coming to take him? Are they, what's going on there? I guess I'll find out. This book leaves me with more burning questions about the magic and souls and um even just the names of certain beings the soul taken brings me back to the other cool scene that i was visualizing in my head in the warren about halfway through the book we come across this ship with the undead with the headless imas are they imas are they they're no they're tisti andy i think or tisti ador one of them the headless beings uh, with the undead dragon that appears and that undead dragon appearing at the very end. What's that about? It, there's just the mysteries that he builds up are visually very cool. But also the lore. You want to delve deeper into it. So yeah, it's a very, very cool. And I, I just found the entire book structured in this kind of cyclical way. So much reference to archaeology and history and the atrocities of humankind just get, gave this book so many layers of depth that you could ponder it forever. <laughs> and it will, I see the reread value. I really do see the reread value now as well. I, I saw that with Gardens of the Moon, 
But I think the depth and the richness of Dead House Gates has really sold me on that idea of the the reread value of these books. And there's plenty of shit in this book that I probably didn't pick up on. I feel like it's intentionally left somewhat mysterious to make you keep reading. And then you can go back later when you have more answers and see little bits of foreshadowing and see bits of here's how he was building this in, here's what this meant. The symbolism is just, it's off the chain. Chains as well. The visual symbolism of chains, even calling this big horde of people the chain of dogs and this constant reference of they're eating their own tail and chained link by link, it's all... The symbolism is great. I'm sure I could word vomit and talk myself through to a more coherent interpretation but it's it's not alienating to the point where if you don't see these things you're not going to enjoy the book it's there to give it a flavor to give it a mystique an aura and it's an aura you want to sink into so anyway i could probably talk in circles like the whirlwind like an onion but I'm not going to. I don't want the video to be too long. I also want to give myself permission to go off and see other people's interpretations. I, I purposefully stayed away from video reviews and other reviews really on Goodreads. And about halfway through the book, I kind of stopped talking about it to friends even um, on Discord. I and Not to mention I was busy at the time, but also I kind of wanted to go on the journey myself and see what I thought of the book, how I was interpreting things. If I have gotten some things wrong, please let me know in the comments. If I am way off the mark with some of my interpretations, in your opinion, let me know. Uh, if you think some of my opinions or interpretations are spot on, also let me know in the comments. I do think this book is well worth discussing and obviously this series has a reputation for being well worth discussing. But please remember to keep it respectful in the comments. I know this series is a bit of a following and people will get passionate about it but if my interpretations are wrong don't call me a dickhead i'll just call you a dickhead <laughs> i won't but yeah do please let me know in the comments if i'm hitting on something let me know um would love to chat about this book and um if you've read dead house gates where does it rank in the malazan books for you i'm curious to know how it's gonna go for me going forward memories of ice has already been picked up. Don't know how long it's gonna take me, it's a big boy, but I've already read the prologue of Memories of Ice, which was very cool. So I'm looking forward to more. Stick around, follow me to see how I get on with the Malazan journey, and uh, subscribe, and like the video if you liked it. Dislike it if you disliked it. But as always, I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.